Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Brussels and welcome to our session on resilient low carbon European industries in a new era. My name is Ulla Engelmann and I'm working at the European Commission. My guests in this session will be three industry leaders across Europe and we will discuss the industrial transformation that is needed in order to achieve the decarbonisation of the energy intensive industries ecosystem. In order to support this transition under the European Green Deal, the European Commission has launched several initiatives on decarbonising EU's industries, including new European partnerships under Horizon Europe, a high-level group on energy-intensive industries, and now the tool of EU Common Industrial Technology Roadmaps in the new strategy for the European Research Area, and the transition pathways in the updated industrial strategy published recently. Energy intensive industries are important for Europe in all EU member states. They are not commonly known to be research intensive, but R&I is essential for the industrial transformation that will lead to EU climate neutrality in the coming 30 years. Disruptive low-carbon technologies need to become business as usual for EU industries because we need to be more and faster emission reductions. Overall, we speak about roughly a doubling of average improvements per year in sectors such as chemicals, cement, steel and other metals, ceramic and more. This is dramatic but needed for the European citizens. So energy intensive industries require significant investment into research and innovation, demonstration and rollout of new technologies. The recently published Low Carbon Industrial Technology Prospects Report by DG Research and Innovation and the Joint Research Centre indicates that average production costs with breakthrough technologies could increase by 2050 up to 112% for steel, 150% for cement and 277% for plastics. A big challenge is to accelerate the take-up of research results and to innovate heavy industries with long, expensive investment cycles. This is why I ask our guests with their key challenges, what are their key challenges, and we will discuss why engage in the European projects and what to do for an impactful European technology roadmaps and investment agendas. Allow me to welcome Mr. Luis Cabra, Executive Managing Director for Energy Transition, Sustainability and Technology and Deputy CEO of Repsol, joining us from Spain. Mr. Nicolas Cudre moreau Group General Manager Research and Innovation, CTO of Solvay, joining us from Belgium. Mr. Roberto Calieri, CEO of Ital Cementi, joining us from Italy. Gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, on our panel today. Before starting the session, I would like to let the audience know that you can contribute to this session. And it is important to contribute because this will feed our policy process. There is a Q&A session under Slido, slide.do, which will really use it. Look at, uh, we will look at your questions and we plan to address them later in the session. Please go to Slido, use the code RIDAYSEU and then it is important connect to channel 2. We are channel 2. There is also a Slido poll with one question. Your votes will really show us at the end of the session what you consider as the most important uh, aspects for the decarbonisation of the energy intensive industries in Europe. The question available on your mobile phones or laptops is what would you identify as the most effective strategy for decarbonisation of EU's energy intensive industries? A. 
putting in place an incentivizing regulatory framework that encourages innovation and commercialization of new technologies, B, defining common industrial technology roadmaps that enable better use of R&I investment and results across Europe, C, coordinated support for R&I investments, including EU and national schemes. And of course, you can also use the chat uh, box uh, to communicate with us. So without any further ado, let me start our conversation. Dear guests, with our industry strategy update, we are keen to have a pragmatic understanding of the needs of the different industrial ecosystems as they transform. And the transition pathways will help us to translate the high level objectives into reality. And we see research and innovation playing a key role here. When it comes to investing in technologies, what are the most important incentives driving your investment for decarbonisation, particularly as regards to transformative R&I? What are you offering as commitment from industry sites and what do you expect from public administrations? Mr. Capra, allow me to start you with you. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of uh, Repsol and also on behalf of the uh, Fuels Europe and Concawe, which is the Association of European Refiners that I've been honoured uh, to be the president for the next uh, two years. And, uh, well, you, you can imagine that being in a sector that today is supplying the energy needs of mobility and also homes uh, processing uh, oil and gas, it's a double challenge, the target of decarbonisation. So I would say that the main driver which is leading us to invest heavily on, on having such a vision for 2050 is the conviction that we need to be climate neutral in 2050. And we have to give decisive steps from the place we are today, offering the energy that is required to what we need in 2050. So the main driver leading to investment is ambition, and targets and being sure that this is what the world needs and what the, the uh, Europe the, the Europe needs also. So in that in that sense I, I would offer uh, to, to uh, visit our website uh, Fields Europe and Concawe. They have a very clear vision. We have a very clear vision 2050, clean fuels for all and you will see there a clear roadmap towards 2050. The same for Repsol as a company going in the same direction. So we, what we can offer? We can offer research, technology deployment, and innovation. We've been doing that in our conventional world till today. And we are offering also capital allocation at risk. At the end of the day, this industry, as other heavy industries in Europe, uh, they are capital intensive. We've been risking capital for many years. We want to continue doing so. And we believe that we have the capabilities and the execution skills in order to make it happen. The difference now with regards to research and innovation is that we have been using in the recent past to use, I would say, mature technologies readily available. And now we are implementing technologies that are not maybe rocket science, but requires a big effort of research, of technology development, and scale up. Some of the technologies we need to use, and we are speaking about advanced biofuels, hydrogen, etc., they have been tested at low scale. So it's not just pure basic research, it's a scale up of technologies. Uh, for instance, an, an electrolyzer needs to move from one megawatt to 100 megawatt. And this is something that requires a lot of research, a lot of innovation, and a lot of collaboration along the value chain. So what we expect was the third part of your question. Well, I would say that the single thing that I would highlight that we expect is a supportive and stable regulatory framework. We see that the technology roadmaps and the research and uh, innovation roadmaps that are developed by this DG is a good, I would say, point of departure to illuminate the rest of the regulation that will make things happen 
at the marketplace. Uh, so from time to time, we see that research and innovation roadmaps are more open. They, they are open to all options to decarbonize our energy supply. Then moving into regulation, things may become a little bit more deterministic. So what we expect is the regulatory framework to be very open, to, to put objectives very ambitious on decarbonization and, ELO, and leave all technologies and solutions to compete. But we are not here to just to, to expect and request things and demand things we are here to offer. And we have already started uh, without waiting to the final outcome of the regulation. We are already investing in biofuels. We are already investing in hydrogen and, sy and synthetic fuels, for instance. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. And I would now turn the question to Nicola. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's face it. Uh, we are part of the problem. We are also part of the solution, all right? So just that realization, I think, is, uh, is a fundamental uh, step in the, in the right direction. And um, as mentioned, I think the, the entire industry is now realizing that um, what we are dealing with is of such a magnitude that only collaboration and putting in place the right frameworks will, uh, will, help, us, uh, will help us get there. And that's a very important point. And we, we are now, I think, uh, close to a tipping point, or maybe we passed already this tipping point, um, where instead of um, approaching things individually um, is, uh, is not the best option anymore. And you see, for example, what, what happened with the battery initiative, uh, what Europe was able to pull together <laughs> Um, when, um, when we realized that it was um, of strategic importance to have, uh, to have battery technology in Europe for production in Europe. And yes, it started maybe more from a, a geopolitical point of view, uh, but it enabled bringing forces together and, and putting in place the right uh, regulatory framework. So I think these kind of things are very important. Now, what do we do uh, ourselves? So we look at things um, in, um, in different stages. And the first one is obviously to eliminate uh, as much as possible uh, sources of energy that produce a lot of CO2. And so from that point of view, for example, uh, we committed to eliminated coal as a source of uh, energy in our industry. Um, and so sources of energy that uh, have less impact definitely are the, the first uh, top priority. I would not call it a no-brainer or a low-hanging fruit because this is not a trivial uh, transition, um, but it's one that uh, clearly will bring a significant impact. The second, the second part is to look at our own products and especially our raw materials and look at not only sustainability, but also circularity. And so looking at raw materials that are not oil-based, so replacing oil-based raw materials by bio-based raw materials. This is a, an, another major uh, transition from us. Uh, it, uh, it means being uh, familiar with um, technologies uh, that were not our core technologies initially. Um, but that's very important, and, um, and we have active projects on, on this. So I would call that the second stage of the, of the rocket. Now, the, the third one, the, the ultimate one that will take more efforts, that will take more fundamental research, is about completely rethinking, basically, our, uh, our processes. In other words, um, taking uh, our production processes back to, to zero and, and rethinking, redesigning them, um, keeping in mind uh, sustainability right from the beginning. And that's a fundamental change. And, and now we do that, for example, for all our projects. We do not start the research projects. We do not consider an investment, a production investment, without assessing quantitatively what the impact will be from a sustainability and circularity point of view. This is a fundamental change. In the past, we were developing new products and processes. And towards the end, we were looking at the sustainability aspects. I exaggerate a little bit. I make it a little bit black and white. But that's a very fundamental fundamental change. Now, what do we need? Uh, I go back to what Mr. Cabra mentioned about stability of the regula uh, regulatory framework. I fully agree with that. I would add one more element. It has to be facts and science-based. One, one issue we have is when 
emotional drivers take over and we end up with regulations that are not based on science and um, in facts. And so that stability combined with science and fact-based regulations is a tremendous uh, enabler uh, for, uh, for the right uh, innovation to, to take place. Thank you very much. And now, Roberto, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, a couple of words also from the world of uh, cement. Uh, so cement, uh, I would say, is uh, part of two ecosystems. The first one in terms of production uh, is uh, uh, we are part of the energy intensive ecosystem, but also through our products, uh, we are part uh, of the uh, construction ecosystem. Uh, our business, uh, uh, in line with the objectives of the EU Green Deal, uh, has uh, made some firm commitments to decarbonization by 2050 with intermediate uh, targets to be reached uh, uh, by 2030, which means a reduction of 55% uh, of our emissions uh, comparing to a baseline of 1990. This is a very challenging environment for us because, of course, we face uh, enormous uh, uh, complexity in several aspects. And again, as usual, we have uh, also uh, low-hanging fruits and long-term uh, uh, targets. The low-hanging fruits in our business uh, are the ones that we are working on, which means trying to, again, utilize uh, less fossil fuels, uh, so leveraging the utilization of alternative fuels. We are, of course, uh, uh, high uh, intensity in terms of fuels, and, and uh, we are trying to replace with biomass uh, and uh, with the different uh, uh, situation in different countries. I'm talking from Italy, and in Italy we have a very, very adverse environment to the utilization of alternative fuels. For example, we are reducing the utilization of our byproduct, uh, the so-called clinker in the cement uh, composition, which means trying to utilize uh, less uh, emissions coming from the clinker and utilizing more raw materials and blending, blended cements. Uh, utilize uh, natural gas or hydrogen where applicable. Utilizing a new alternative raw materials, again, always uh, in the same direction. But the one and most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, innovative solution, which uh, is somehow a must in our business, uh, is the so-called carbon capture and storage uh, technology. Why? Because our business, uh, about two-thirds of our emissions are process-related, which means uh, we utilize, we utilize uh, calcium carbonate, uh, uh, which basically after decarbonization is, uh, uh, becomes an oxide, an oxide and uh, a CO2. So there is nothing we can do uh, to balance differently this uh, chemical equation. So two-thirds of our emissions come from there. And it looks like the one and only opportunity we have to decarbonize is uh, to uh, basically capture and storage uh, this uh, part of the mission. And uh, uh, these emissions will increase in the future because uh, as we expect markets to grow and uh, needs of infrastructure development to grow, we expect also these uh, levels of emissions to grow so the problem does not get uh, any uh, smaller because we need to respond to fundamental needs uh, of, the, of the progress and development uh, of the humankind. So that's why uh, we think that our uh, sector uh, is uh, definitely at uh, a very important point. I think we're facing uh, a situation which never we have seen before, uh, where, as you mentioned before, uh, the risk of a uh, cost increase uh, is uh, tremendous in the future. And uh, so it's clear that uh, uh, there are involved uh, capital investments uh, of uh, magnitude which we could never imagine before. But that's not the only one thing. We need uh, an overall participation uh, uh, to this uh, to this project. So this brings me to the last part of your question. What uh, we put on the table uh, uh, to solve the problem, we put on the table the development of technologies that were absolutely out uh, of our minds until a few years ago, and which are uh, growing in terms of uh, importance exponentially on our, uh, on our agendas. What we expect uh, from the public administration, of course, we expect the participation in terms uh, of uh, capital allocation, which is uh, clear. But as I said, it's not only a matter of money. It's also a matter of uh, a sincere cooperation and sincere participation, because uh, part of the problem, uh, we need to solve it inside our business, inside our plants. And we know it's what I mentioned already a couple of times, this carbon capture 
technology. But we need also somewhere to put this uh, uh, CO2, and uh, we need so we need the uh, opportunities to transport it, and we need the places to storage it. And this is all but an easy uh, task, of course, because uh, uh, this leads to the possibility of uh, a cross business, I would say, need, because it's not only us, but will be all other businesses in the same situation, in, uh, like cement or chemicals. Uh, so this opens. Uh, the, 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 I would say the stage to a very cross country and cross business project, which is a, a real a project of common interest, I would say, for everybody, where everybody should participate in that. So this is our great expectation, is the fact that there will be a, a commitment from all parties involved, because this is really something which we cannot do without uh, a, a real, real participation of uh, all the stakeholders. And the other uh, stakeholders are clearly, I would say, really everybody, starting from us as producers, uh, going to the state members, to the European uh, uh, Commission, uh, to the landlords which own the pieces of land where maybe pipelines are supposed to pass, uh, or to the transportation companies which will be involved, or everybody. This is something extremely big, but extremely important because. Uh, we really feel, and I cannot hide our concern, that our sector is at uh, risk in this moment, because short of a uh, solid and uh, shared by all parties but, uh, a commitment that will be a, a real risk, because there is no easy solution to this problem. Thank you very much. Uh, um, now, the second question, because we have spoken about the long investment cycles, and uh, so the goals are just around the corner. So what is the most promising factor that makes you optimistic that you and your sector will achieve the needed emissions reductions for the Green Deal? And uh, what is a potential barrier which makes you concerned about this? And what influence uh, could and I have in this context? So I would like to ask you uh, to be quite concise with your answers because we have a very uh, restricted time and uh, no march of maneuver. So, Nicola, could you please start? Sure. Um, so, we talked about the regulatory frameworks. Um, we talked about their stability. Um, I think another element which is very important here is, um, is the level playing field. And let's face it, uh, Europe is, uh, number one, not isolated. Uh, we are in a global marketplace. Uh, the, the other thing is that Europe has a certain level of complexity um, that can, in some cases, be, uh, be an issue compared to uh, the US or China, for example. And so I think two things that are really important. So we need this um, level playing field. Uh, we need to make sure not only we do what is right for the planet, but we also ensure the long-term sustainability of our companies. In other words, um, we must remain competitive while doing what is right, what we are, what we are talking about. So I think that's a, that's a very important element and also a concern. And can we do that? And, uh, and I think the answer is yes. And again, I, I like to use uh, the example of, uh, of the battery initiative. It's, um, it's, a great, it's a great one. And we realize that, uh, that we have uh, something significant to do. We realized that without collaboration, it was just impossible. And uh, in an amazingly fast time, a short amount of time, we were able to, to pull something um, concrete together. Uh, look at uh, also what was done around COVID-19. Definitely, it was not perfect. Um, collaboration could have been better. But still, at the end of the day, when the crisis is here, we, um, we, we can react and, and come together. So that's my source of, um, of optimism. Um, and again, the, the concern is, uh, is, uh, is the level playing field. We need, uh, we need to, to maintain that. Um, so this is, um, this is basically what, uh, what I think we, we should focus on. Okay, thank you very much. Roberto, what is your point of view? Uh, listen, I speak by my experience and what I'm saying. Uh, I would say that my element uh, of hope and uh, the positive factor is the fact that uh, I really see now this uh, issue of decarbonization on the top of the agenda of our board. I mean, the company really cares, the company has really shown uh, 
a visible, visible uh, boost of commitment uh, uh, in the recent uh, year and a couple of years. So all the companies really moved uh, very fast towards uh, a different level of urgency and different level of commitment, which is uh, what shows that the energy is there, uh, tools uh, are being implemented, the idea projects uh, are being, uh, again, uh, started. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, just talking about very pragmatic thing in uh, the company I work for and other uh, I mean, all the managers of the top managers have been uh, in, in the MBO scheme have been uh, put as a, in our, a CO2 point uh, as a target. So uh, also the compensation is affected by the level of results uh, of this, which shows, I mean, I would say the highest level of engagement uh, the company can give. Uh, on managers. So visibility is absolutely there and the commitment too. And this makes me very optimistic because as we all know, work pays off. One point of concern, uh, I'd say yes, is the fact that uh, culturally in Europe uh, we are uh, uh, not very prone for uh, high risk financial models. And uh, as usual, breakthrough technologies like the one I mentioned before, it's clearly something which is uh, uh, carry financial and technology risks, and this is where, uh, of course, uh, I could see some uh, complexity. Uh, also, and especially because not only funding could be public, but uh, could be also there could be also equity funding in this project. Why not? And for to, in order to have equity funding, funding, of course, you need to have something which is, uh, I mean, which makes uh, possible uh, return schemes which are acceptable. And with level of risks which can be absorbed and can be accepted. Uh, so, in this term, I think we are still in an early phase and we need to develop some uh, possibilities. Now, they are talking of these contracts for difference, whereby, let's say, investors could be somehow protected uh, in case of uh, high fluctuations on the price of uh, on CO2 price. Uh, at the last, I think that uh, uh, is additional barrier, uh, but this is something quite uh, normal. I won't spend much time because everybody knows it. Is the fact that uh, lack of consistency in coordination amongst the different uh, funding instruments, uh, combined with the usual heavy administrative and bureaucratic uh, uh, processes, could be another reason of delay or uh, or unnecessary and complex. And on this, uh, very frankly, I'm looking at the. European funds for uh, resilience and recovery applied to our industry. So I would really like that there would be, uh, I don't want to use the word fast track because it's an abuse, but something which makes really things work uh, in the way they should, because this is uh, an urgency for all of us. And uh, so we should also see the possibility of money spent and well spent uh, and fast, especially with the fast, uh, with the fast move. Thank you very much. Luis, your point of view, please. Okay. In, in our case, optimism comes from having a clear vision, which is climate neutrality in 2050, and having a relatively clear roadmap already. Uh, speaking from the energy producers, we would base our roadmap in three pillars. One, renewable electrification, and Repsol is investing on that. Second, low carbon liquid and gaseous fuels that will provide energy where electrification cannot reach. And third, uh, commented uh, by, by one of my colleagues, is carbon capture and use or storage. So having that clear vision and uh, having already started on that, I have to be all uh, very, very optimistic on, on the way because now what we need to do is execute the roadmap. Potential barriers. I would echo what uh, what uh, Nicolas and Roberto were saying on from from regulation. On one side, a level playing field. On the other side, avoid complexity and unnecessary bureaucracy on the processes. And I would add a third point, which is uh, technology neutrality. We always speak about that, but uh, sometimes we are a little bit deterministic. Keep all doors open to technology solutions that helps decarbonization. So just to end, what is the, the role of, of research and, in, and innovation in this context? I believe research and innovation is, a, is an eye-opener and a door-opener. Because if you look at the technology roadmaps being developed and research and innovation uh, being developed by, by the European Commission, 
all, all potential promising technologies are there. So if we can translate that into the same technology neutrality to open the doors to any potential solution to climate in terms of technology development and deployment, uh, I believe that, that again, the role of, of RNI is to be an eye opener for the rest of the regulation. Thank you very much. And uh, don't forget that you can still uh, put your points into Slido. And we now come to the last question from my side. And uh, we have mentioned earlier that uh, in the context of developing the EU common industrial technology roadmaps with common investment agendas to support deep carbonization of the energy intensive uh, industry ecosystem, what is one key message you would like to share with us. What would be the key success factors for pan-European cooperation and who needs to participate so that uh, these strategies can be the blueprint for successful decarbonisation of your industries? So please highlight from your perspective what would be an important deliverable to ensure that our joint work on common industrial technology roadmaps can support our common objectives towards decarbonisation. Roberto, would you like to start this time, please? Sure, thanks. But uh, I'd say that um, probably I'll repeat and wrap up a few of the concepts I already expressed. Uh, to facilitate the ecological transition, I think that uh, the decarbonisation uh, uh, process uh, is not only a matter of uh, investments uh, and uh, uh, again, projects and research is also a matter of uh, a virtuous, sincere dialogue with the policymakers. And this is extremely important that there is a common and shared understanding uh, um, of the of the problem. Uh, in addition, uh, I think that uh, it's clear that uh, the participation of the public uh, actors uh, is required, uh, and uh, uh, in order to support the companies, this is uh, another message I want to leave with because uh, it's fundamental. And uh, again, a third point: uh, uh, we need to overcome some important obstacles, which we see complexity in authorization processes uh, and the construction of the infrastructure. And countries uh, uh, are uh, fundamental. Um, I'd like to come back to my point on this because it's a real pain point uh, and I think that uh, the industrial technology roadmaps need to be extremely sensitive to this one. Uh, we have uh, spread across Europe about 200 cement plants and by natural cement plants are located the next to the quarries where our raw material limestone is uh, and so our spread out in different uh, areas, uh, often remote areas. I think industrial technology roadmaps need to keep in consideration the fact that we need to allow each single one of these plants to decarbonize, which means uh, they are not clustered all in a region, and so uh, the complexity comes from being spread out. So this makes, again, infrastructural uh, uh, projects quite complex. And uh, uh, we need to take care of each single one of these plants. And this, I think, is where we really see a major, a major challenge in our, uh, in our project. In addition, uh, there should be more access to the utilization, again, as I said before, of alternative fuels, uh, of all those uh, steps, uh, actions, or uh, low-hanging fruits with, on which we are working at the moment, and where we often see different countries with different intensity, a lot of uh, complexity. Um, so, uh, again, I think uh, short and long term uh, message is uh, we need uh, everybody involved with the same uh, uh, commitment on this because it's something that uh, it's either all or nothing and uh, we need uh, uh, this to be made clear, especially to the policymakers. Thank you very much. Uh, Luis? Yeah, I, to, to be concise, I would join the two parts, uh, the, the first two parts of the question into a single one, because for me, the key message is that we need cooperation. Cooperation is not just good, it's indispensable, because the, the challenge of, of climate neutrality is so big that individual companies cannot do alone. So uh, I, I, would, I would foster collaboration at all levels. Uh, a single company can collaborate. Uh, we have a, in Red Solar Research Center which is uh, working on an open innovation mode. 
cooperating with uh, universities, other research centers, investing in startups, uh, and, and I believe this is the first stage. Then you go to a sector level cooperation. And uh, well, the example of industry associations, like in our case, Fields Europe and Concawe, joining forces in order to cooperate uh, when we are working on non-competitive matters. Then now things are moving into uh, across sector cooperation. And I believe that this is being reinvigorated very much during the last years. Uh, Fuels Europe and Concawe, we are cooperating with the, uh, with the mobility industry, with the other heavy industry like cement, like steel, like others, uh, chemicals. So all this cross-sectorial cooperation is needed. And the last, I would say, but not least part of the cooperation, public-private uh, partnerships. And we are seeing much more of that. And of course, the European Commission is very instrumental and very key actor on these public-private uh, pr partnerships. So uh, deliverables. Uh, I believe that, that the, the research and innovation roadmap is a key deliverable by itself. Uh, I, 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 I repeat what I said in the previous question. I believe this should be the, the key element illuminating the rest of the regulation to be technology neutral, to be to establishing a level playing field in which companies will be competing and will be succeeding at the marketplace that at the end we need to be uh, uh, economically sustainable, uh, the same as we need to be climate sustainable. Thank you very much. And Nicola, please. All right, I will, uh, same thing, try to be concise and not repeat everything that was said because I, I agree with um, the main points made. Um, I would just add one, one more thing in the, in the field of collaboration and, and how to approach some of these, um, these uh, opportunities and problems. I think it's really important to have an ecosystem approach to, to look at entire value chains um, versus suboptimizing. Suboptimizing, uh, I think, has the danger of uh, taking us to incremental solutions. And in some cases, even uh, solutions being positive for one part of the value chain, but negative for the rest of it. And, and that's obviously not what uh, we're going to do. If I build on my example around, around batteries, and um, batteries are great, uh, they enable electrification. And from that point of view, uh, we'll have a big impact from a CO2 emissions point of view. Uh, but you need to recycle them. You need to think about the end of life of these batteries. And that was a great example of something that cannot be done with only one company. So in our case, I, we collaborate with uh, Renault and Veolia. In bringing these three together, we can now design recycling in the, in, uh, right from the beginning and take that into account versus doing it after the fact. Again, looking at an ecosystem brings much more impact um, at the end. Now, uh, the collaboration with, um, with the public sector, um, my key message is about the role of science. All right? We have, um, if you look at uh, innovation, how it works, you have science, which is mainly curiosity driven uh, as, a, as a fundamental, as a, as a foundation. You have research focused on finding solutions to problems and, and opportunities. And you have innovation, which is about creating value uh, with, with the results. The science base is very important. Just one example, CO2 chemistry. What can we do with CO2 as a raw material versus uh, just uh, sequestering it? Um, this is very fundamental science. This cannot be done when, by one or even a group of companies without major support from the public sector. These are the kind of initiatives I think we need to identify and we need to play to win. So we need critical mass. Uh, we cannot invest a billion when others are investing 10 or 20 billion in, um, in similar areas. Uh, so I think it's really important to make choices. We cannot go after everything. We need to make choices about the big impact. And again, play to win, um, fund for success. I think that's uh, an absolutely critical point. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now looking at uh, Slido, and of course we are quite short in time, but I would want to read out uh, the question which got uh, the most marks. How the additional cost from the decarbonisation process should be distributed among the consumers, investors and the states. So um, you have, uh, I would say all of you, maximum one minute on your distribution. Uh, so. Uh, Maybe, Luis, what do you think? How should it be distributed? Well, I be, I, I'm a firm believer that, that, that at the end of the day, it comes with establishing or putting in practice a price of uh, carbon. Uh, so at the end of the day, everything has to be invested and paid by the society. You can do it. Uh, within the price of the final product. You can do it through taxes. At the, at the end of the day, all money comes from the taxpayer and the consumer, that we are all citizens, in this case, in the European Union. So let's put in place something that really takes into account, which is the extra cost of decarbonizing. There is an extra cost, but there is an extra premium. Is the premium of getting to climate neutrality. So this is a cost. There are different ways of applying that. You can use a, a carbon trading system, as we have partially in the European Union. We may have uh, carbon taxes, or we may have, in some ways, certain legislations or regulations like uh, the Renewable Energy Directive, which is obliging to uh, is imposing to use a certain percentage of renewable energy into uh, your your uh, fuel system. So Th all this you, works, Luis, provided is, is, is sustainable. Sorry for that, but I believe this is my, my main point. OK, and I hope that uh, the other uh, two panelists agree with it, because we won't have time uh, to go to you now. So I would like to go to the poll. Um, so, and uh, what would you identify as the most effective strategy for the decarbonisation of EU's energy intensive industries? And with 51%, putting in place an incentivizing regulatory framework that encourages innovation. And uh, if we look at this poll, I think this is also very much what I have heard from you throughout uh, your intervention in this panel, because you were also very much focusing on the regulatory framework. You said also it needs a stable regulatory framework, but of course also encouraging innovation. So I think uh, the poll confirms also what uh, has been discussed in the panel. So to, to wrap up, uh, I think uh, uh, it became clear the need for R&I and I think what you also pointed out, the synergies in the different investment agendas. Because we see that we have different funding instruments and that we need to see how to bring them together. So this upcoming uh, common EU common industrial uh, technology roadmaps, they will make the missing links and also it was mentioned just uh, in the last intervention, accelerate also the cross-sector uh, tech transfer and scale up. And this also should then be linked to what we will be discussing also, uh, the transition pathways. And I think it is really important to bring the different elements together. So we really need this clear pathways and you are all invited to contribute because you all said it, cooperation is key on all levels. So uh, we are very much looking forward to engage with all to you in a co-creation process in helping this transition pathways. Thank you very much.